Hello and welcome to another episode of Making Stuff Look Good in Unity. In this episode, we'll explore the basics of Unity's animation tools and talk a bit about the principles of animation. First and foremost, why use Unity's built-in animation tools? There's no shortage of animation software out there, and some of the major players will even export to Unity's native .anim clip file. These tools will almost all have a richer set of features and better interfaces for animating than Unity. So let me offer up two reasons why it's worthwhile to learn the ins and outs of Unity's animation tools. Reason number one, convenience. Sometimes the path of least resistance is the best way to go. If you need to animate something very simple, a rotation or a position tween for a single object, bringing in another tool to your content pipeline is definitely overkill. And if animations across your whole project are relatively simple, keeping them in Unity can cut out the middleman between your art asset software and your game. Reason number two, because you'll straight up have to. As amazing as some animation suites are, they'll never support everything that is deemed animatable in Unity. This could include animating public fields of mono behaviors, UI properties like anchor positions, or the many attributes of the particle system. At the end of the day, you'll be hard pressed to completely avoid the animation window, so you might want to start embracing it. So let's dig in. Here we have four objects, each showing a different animation of a ball bouncing. They all hit the ground at the same time and take one second to loop. With each ball from left to right, a different principle of animation has been added to the preceding ball. We'll start by recreating the bounce on the left and work our way across, observing another principle with each step. Our starting point will be this object, a transform with two children, one for the ball and one for the shadow. We could have the ball sprite be the root object, but that will cause all sorts of annoyances that I'll get into later. With our simple hierarchy of objects set up, we can select the root transform, open up the animation window and hit create. This will do several things for us. It adds the animator component to our object. It creates an animation controller and assigns it to the animator. The controller stores information about state transitions and other information that governs how the animations will be played at runtime. And finally, it creates an animation clip and assigns that clip as the default state for the new controller. Quick note, there's also a component called animation as opposed to animator. The former is the legacy component and the latter is the new hotness, which is what you should use for any project newer than like Unity 4.0x. Okay, so we've got our object hierarchy set up, our animator component, controller, and first clip ready to go, and we're ready to start animating. We'll start off by hitting record, telling the animation window to track changes to the object and insert keyframes representing those changes. If you've done any keyframe animation in other programs, this shouldn't look unfamiliar. We'll go to frame 30 of our timeline and bring the ball down along the y-axis. In the inspector, you can see that the animated properties are tinted red. Also note that a keyframe was generated at the start of the timeline with the initial position as its value. Now we can bring the ball back up to its starting height at the 60th frame. We could have also just copy pasted the starting frame with good old control CV. With these three frames keyed in, we can sweep over our timeline and see that the ball's height is interpolated over all the in-between frames. You'll notice that the default interpolation isn't quite linear. The default setting for keys is actually auto, which does its best to get a smooth and continuous playback. In our case, we actually want to avoid this smoothing, so we'll highlight all of our keyframes, right click on any of them, and set both tangents to linear. I'll show off how to get more granular control of interpolation in a minute, but for now just think of it as the difference between this interpolation and this one. You can hit play on the animation window and preview our finished animation now. It's not great. We'll suspend disbelief that this ball would keep bouncing to the exact same height every time, but even then it just doesn't feel right, does it? Luckily for us, a couple of badass Disney animators wrote a book in the 80s teaching the rest of us plebs how to animate. They came up with 12 principles of animation, and we're going to improve our ball animation dramatically using three of them. We'll start with timing. When animating to mimic physical movements, how much time each action takes is very important. Picture an object accelerating. If it were to move from left to right, we would draw more frames towards the left side when it is moving slower, and fewer frames on the right when it is moving quickly. In the case of our ball, the critical actions are hang time and impact. If the ball is being dropped, it would be momentarily suspended in air and accelerate due to the force of gravity. The point at which it's moving fastest would be the instant before it strikes the ground. We're pretending there is zero energy loss here, so all that speed goes right back into the upwards force now working against gravity. Let's fix the timing of our animation to better reflect how physics would act on it. 
We know we want the ball to hang in the air, so we'll set the first and last keys to flat interpolation. That already looks a bit better, but the point of impact still doesn't have enough oomph. Highlighting that keyframe and switching from dope sheet to curves view, we can see the actual curve that will be sampled as the animation plays. We'll switch the tangents of the Y value at the point of impact to free. Now we can move these handles to manipulate the curve. By bringing in these handles, we're allocating fewer frames to the time around impact and more frames to the hang time. Once we've got a sexy curved V shape, we can preview our animation. Timing is one of the most important principles. It's intuitive because we're so used to the way objects move in real life, but it can be elusive at times when we're animating. Adding more keyframes and editing the interpolation curves are both good ways to control the timing of an action. The next principle of animation we'll tackle is squash and stretch. Squash and stretch can be applied to an object to give weight, illustrate velocity, exaggerate impact, and add comical effect. It's arguably even more important than timing, but both principles together are the bread and butter of animation. We'll use scale to squash the ball at the point of impact and have it stretch and wobble back to its default scale on its ascent. When squashing and stretching, try to keep the volume of the object consistent. For an object of unit scale, maintaining the volume means that at any point, the product of the XYZ scale should be approximately 1. In my animation here, I've added a key just before impact with no scale change, and then I've also made it flat, so that automatic interpolation doesn't introduce any unwanted scaling. Now preview your animation and bask in the glory of squash and stretch. The final principle we'll observe in our bouncing animation is secondary action. This principle references anything that adds life to the scene and supports the main action. This could be a character swinging their arms as they walk or bobbing their head. So far, we've had a shadow sitting motionless on the ground below the ball. It's been useful to give information about where the ball is in the pseudo 3D scene, but we can also use it to reinforce the primary action of the ball. We'll animate the shadow scale to have it larger when the ball is airborne, and smaller at the moment of impact. We'll again use a sexy V-shaped curve to match the motion of the ball. We'll also animate the alpha value of the sprite renderer to make the shadow appear lighter when the ball is up high and darkest when the ball hits the ground. Comparing our initial bounce animation to our end result is pretty satisfying, and we didn't have to do nearly as much work as Disney animators would have had to do by hand to leverage their awesome set of principles. Okay, remember when I said having the ball be the root object would cause some annoyances? Well now that we have a nice little animation, let's talk about why. Here, I've written a very simple controller to move the ball around with the arrow keys. This controller is attached to the root object, and it's updating the position of the transform every frame. Now if the ball itself had been the root object, we would have set keyframes governing the position of its transform when creating the bounce animation. Those positions are relative to the parent transform, and so if we had animated the root object, those positions would refer to exact world coordinates. Because the animation update happens after the script update in the execution order, this means whatever position change we did to the ball in our script would be undone by the animator. This goes for any other transform changes too. The keyframe values we set for position, rotation, and scale are all relative to the parent object, not to the world. So by keeping a nice hierarchy with the root object that we don't move, rotate, or scale by animation, we'll be able to reliably control the transform of our animated object in code. It's important to set up a good hierarchy for anything you'll be animating. Take some time to plan out how each child object might animate. If you want to go back and change things in your hierarchy later on, you risk breaking any animations you've created so far. This includes renaming objects or changing the parent-child relationships. Also note that animated objects must be uniquely named on a per-parent basis. That covers the basics of animation in Unity, and I do mean the absolute most basic of basics. We've still got a lot more to cover, I only briefly mentioned the animator and controller in this video, but they are what will control when and how your animations play. In Animation 102, we'll look at more complex hierarchies, how to set up state machines to drive animations, and write some code to control our animator. Thank you all for watching. As usual, I'll include a link in the description where you can download the resources for this video. You can use the end results for reference, but I strongly recommend you recreate them for yourself and do some experimenting on your own. I've got my next couple videos planned out, including the next entry in the shader series. If you're interested in that or any of my other upcoming tutorials, hit up that subscribe button and get the latest the day they release. Until next time.